Hi, I'm DJ Ware. On this episode of the Cyber Gizmo, I'm going to be talking about PondKit, the latest Linux vulnerability, right after this. What I want to talk about today is Linux vulnerability CBE 20214034, or PondKit, as it's better known as. So let's let's talk a little bit about some of the backstory here. Qualys is a research team that discovered a memory corruption vulnerability in PolKits. There's an application called PK Exec, and that is a utility application that is used to launch applications. And in there, you can set what um, what set UID and group UIDs you want to run. So it is a set UID root utility that's installed on almost every Linux distribution, and it also appears on BSD as well. There may be other non-Linux distributions that I'm just not aware of that might be using it. But it allows basically an unprivileged application to gain full root privileges on a, on a vulnerable host without intervening and saying, hey, I need some kind of password here before I will allow this. So what is Polkit? What is this thing? It is a component for controlling system-wide privileges in a Unix-like operating system. So uh, it was developed by uh, David uh, Zuthian from Red Hat, and it, it is hosted on the Free Desktop Org project. It was released, well, this says April 2012, but the actual first release of this was Policy Kit in May of 2009. So it, it, they changed their names in 2012. The slide isn't quite right. Fedora was the first to distribute it, and then other distributions followed suit. But as you can see here, what it's really meant for is to, when you're executing a, in a privileged mode in a graphical user interface, it's supposed to stop and prompt you before allowing you to execute that. Why do we need PullKit anyway? What was the reason for adding this into the, the Linux toolset? So it is a toolkit for handling authorizations. It's used for allowing unprivileged processes to speak with privileged ones. Now remember what I we had talked about on the guard. If you haven't seen that, I'll put a link and you can go check that out again. When you're dealing with uh, multiple level security or MLS, the lower level applications or the ones at lower security levels can only write. They're not they're not allowed to read from higher level security application. Basically, I can send messages to it and I can, in this case, you can receive uh, some information back, but generally you're passing off control to that higher privileged process so that they're able to come up and run or do whatever. In the past, we used to use set UID and group ID access controls uh, in the permissions and the SUID is shown here. Uh, it's still used, although PullKit gets involved today with it, so it augments what's there. Uh, and you'll see that there's a read-write S. The S is for set UID, which means that mount.nfs, if it executes, it executes as whoever is defined as the owner. If the S was in the second group of permissions, it would be the group ID, and then the execution of mount.nfs would assume the role of that group. When it was running, you can control you can control who owns the application when it comes up. However, <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's what it's for, and so yeah, it always makes me nervous that we start running root applications without some authorization. I mean, I don't know how many times that was used to backdoor things in the Unix. World. The old set UID is not necessarily a good thing today. I mean, it it. it it isn't supplanted by PullKit. PullKit sort of augments it. They, they add additional features on top of it. How does it work? I mean, how does this thing work? How is it supposed to work? You have a user session. Maybe you're in a graphical user interface to do this. And when you start up, this authentication agent gets started up automatically with it. Uh, and that allows PullKit is comprised of an authority which is implemented as a service on top of the system message bus or DBUS. Each user session has this authentication agent and it has actions that it can do which are defined to it through the policies which are called authorization rules. Who can set those actions? Applications can, vendors can, programmers can, sites, system administrators can even set them. 
And those policies are allowing those specific actions and controlling what they can do and what they can't. What's this vulnerability? What What is it? <laughs> well, the, let's talk about the impact first. So first of all, an unprivileged user, someone that's just a regular user, can gain full root privileges on a vulnerable host. And those can be running Ubuntu and Debian, Fedora, CentOS. There's other Linux distributions that are likely to have the vulnerability that they just didn't test, the Qualys didn't test. So, And BSD also uses PullKit as well. However, I will say if you run an open BSD, their kernel does not allow the execution of an application if the argc, the arg count that you're passing to the uh, uh, PK exec is zero. And won't even allow it to come up, which is a very wise idea given the fact that we've had these problems in C and C++ before. But so what happens is, is basically it's a drop through uh, problem. There's an if control block that's inside of of the uh, PK exec code that allows me to, if I fall through and I have an argument of basically if it falls all the way through, the argument count is zero. If it allows it to fall through, it will pick up information about what to execute from the uh, environment variable. Basically allows you to become root without a challenge. So yeah, it's a fall through uh, problem and there wasn't anything to catch it, so it falls through. This code problem has been in Polkit for a long time. They checked all the way back to versions of the code from May 2009 and found the vulnerability there. So this is nothing new. It's been sitting in that code. Now, Qualys says in their research they hadn't discovered any exploits in the wild until the announcement date. And I can tell you that after the announcement date on the 25th of uh, January, uh, yeah, the exploits have blown through the roof. What do you, <laughs> Given that, what should you be doing? Well... Update your system as soon as possible, and the vulnerability has been fixed because Qualys, when they announced this to the public, they also published a patch. So, yeah, and those those patches have been distributed out to Debian, Ubuntu, Linux Mint, and some, and some of those others. Now, I did notice that on the Ras Raspberry Pi OS that the pull kit wasn't fixed immediately, but about four hours later, a patch became available. So... Yeah, so not to worry, it, that is fixed there as well. So how do you know if your system's been updated? How do you, how do you validate it? Now, there are uh, instructions that are different for Red Hat, so you might want to go check Red Hat's pages on how to validate whether the patch has been, uh, how the patch is validated. But if you're on a Debian derivative like I am, I'll put this command in the description of this video so you can just run it. And it's uh, basically you're looking at a change log for Debian.gz. And in there, it should come back. This should come back with an entry that has CBE 2021-4034. And it might have some text after it that says, hey, this vulnerability has been patched or something. But if it comes back with no response, then you're not protected. So you know you have the problem on your system. So <laughs> back to armchair quarterbacking or the elephant in the room, if you prefer, so I have two questions that come to mind. So uh, given the issues we've experienced, all and myself included, with C and C++, when you're passing arguments to programs, if you're not careful, you can be in a memory unsafe condition. In other words, you could be, you could be referencing memory that is not intended and not protected by the bounds of your application. The question is that I have here really is, why don't we insist on writing software with unsafe memory? Uh, logic that can happen in it. Why? Why? I mean, so we've known that C now C plus plus is, is a lesser degree, but it's just as bad. So the other thing is, is that Polkit I noticed version release number of zero point one five dot x x x x x. So that zero indicates it's pre release usually. So only applications that have reached the full production state usually hit one point oh. And above, so the the fact that it is running at 0 0.15, if it truly is, and I went back through some of his of David's notes, and I see warning, 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 warning. This is pre-release software. I'm wondering why we, our distributions, are allowing us to put this code into production. The other obvious statement is, uh, it is good that security researchers are finally peeling back the code that we all assume is great, secure, and is invulnerable, right? 
and they're finding these vulnerabilities. I mean, I've heard this argument before. I've countered it many times in my videos about open source being more secure because people can go look at the source code. The question is, how many people actually go and look at the source code and then arrange tests to determine whether that source code is working or not? We, do, we used to do things called bounds testing, where you would see how the program behaves if I were to give it garbage input on the argument on the command line to see how it would react. It's good that we have security researchers that are finally kicking the covers back and looking at the open source and seeing, well, how good is this stuff, really? Uh, is it, I mean, I'm not making an argument that open source is better or worse than commercial software. Is it good that our developers in the open source world, it is also good that developers in the open source world are stepping up. They're not trying to sweep this under the rug. They're not trying to hide it. They're, they're like, okay, we'll fix it. And I think that's great. I mean, I have seen commercial vendors hide. They go running for the cover because they're going to get beat to death with clubs by their boss. But there is one axiom that I've always followed through. I want to pass this along to you. Never code for a condition you can't handle. In other words, that in this case, it was fall-through logic that caused this exploit. So to me, that is, I didn't have a trap at the end that handled, ooh, what else could go wrong? If anything else is happening here, I should trap it. I should exit the program and say, I got a problem. I, it's just like the OpenBSD kernel. I've got an argument count of zero, and I've got data in the argv. What the heck is going on here? That's a problem. Yeah, you should always have at least one entry in the argv and one count because the program name is always passed. So if you get an arg count of zero, you've got a problem. There's something wrong here. And the other thing is that the trend today is to add complexity to things that are normally simple. So like in the case of SUI, as set UID and, and set GID, yeah, they were simple, but they also had traps in them that were just as bad as this. I mean, yeah. So the, um, the problem is, is that we're adding complexity to software. Well, when you add complexity, you, add, you expand the pool of the risks. You expand the surface area or the attack surface of a software and expose additional risks that in your software to the outside world. That's all I had for today. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step up my soapbox. Uh, am I worried about this? No, I'm not worried about this because, it, like I said, it has been patched. But it just, it just freaks me out that, you know, th that we keep finding stuff 12 years down the road. It's like, where did this come from? I mean, how did we find this? Um, yeah, it's just, it just boggles my mind how things work. So that's all I had for today. Hope you enjoyed this video. Please like and subscribe. Hope to see you all again in the next one. Good luck and bye for